This is our June webinar series where we're going to talk about introducing the ecosystem restoration camps. I'm very excited to be here today. Restoration ecology is one of my favorite subjects. So let me just give you um, a bit of a, a guideline about how um, we'll be interacting with you, the audience, today. If we could go to the next slide there. having a few technical issues with Zoom today, so bear with us, please. All right, so here's the webinar attendee guidelines. Um, you're gonna be muted for the duration of the, of the webinar, so that we'll focus on having the audio of our panel um, in the foreground. And you can feel free to enter questions that you have for the panelists um, through your um, control panel. So there's a Zoom Q&A section and Actually, the first thing we'd like, like you to do is go to the chat and tell us where you're um, attending from today, where, where in the world you're coming from. It's always very fun for us to see. We usually zoom through, um, you know, almost every continent. I, was, I think uh, Dr. Elaine and I are still hoping for an Antarctica one of these days, but it'll happen. It'll happen eventually. There's, there's research teams down there. So I'm seeing Dubai and all over the United States, Philadelphia. Oh, it's just going too fast for me to even read here. Uganda, love seeing East Africa represented. Got several places, Sweden. Yeah. So feel free to um, converse with each other in the chat. That's that's a place that you can um, interact. And you know, you can ask questions there. We do have people looking for that, but it's, it's your, your question is more likely to get caught if you, instead of putting it in chat, put it in the Q&A um, section. So we're just here to have fun today, right? We're here to talk about exciting emerging concepts. So I'm really glad to see such a, such a uh, large number of participants here. So let me just give you also an outline of how the the session is going to go if we could get the next slide yeah so we'll just do introductions here for a few minutes and um these are our four panelists john liu janelle luke bob wilms and johnny allen um you also have dr elaine here and myself and and we'll get into a little bit more of our of our backgrounds um in a moment but i do want to mention that uh uh, John is going to give us a little bit of an overview of ecosystem restoration camps, and that's really where they're building some research, training, and innovation centers for ecosystem restoration, um, and it's a big network. And J Janelle is going to talk a bit about the, the campfire restoration project, which is following um, its land restoration following the devastating fires that they had in that area. And Bob will talk about the land which is a, a, a location where um, like-minded community of artists and writers and thinkers and doers are converging to really reconnect with nature and, and um, experience um, restoration holistically. And then Johnny Allen uh, will talk about Birdhouse, which is a, a hub for exchange um, for those attracted to caring for land and people through arts and ecology and there's um you know gardens there in hollywood and such so i'm very excited about the, the diversity that we have represented here in terms of, of projects and then let's let you hear from the panelists as well so if we'll go to the next slide we'll be finishing up with a q a section and, um, and this will take about two hours in total so um i'm your host today dr adam cobb uh you work here at the soul food web school and I'm zooming from Boise, Idaho, which is the ancestral lands of the Shoshone Bannock peoples. And um, I'm going to let uh, Dr. Elaine uh, mention a little bit about where she's coming from, and then we'll go in the order that you see on the screen through our panelists so that they can um, introduce themselves. So Dr. Elaine, are you ready to tell us a little bit about yourself? have to unmute in order to be heard. Hey, so I'm Dr. Elaine Ingham. I am uh, the found, one of the founders of the Soil Food Web School. Um, I'm a soil microbiologist, um, although I do have a background in marine and freshwater um, microbiology. Um, so um, we 
uh, are in, you know, I am in Corvallis, Oregon, and the local indigenous people were the Kalapuya, who did quite a bit of work uh, maintaining the savanna-like conditions in the Willamette Valley. So had a significant effect pre-Europeans uh, arriving here um, due to the actions of the Kalapuya. So go on to John DeLu. Hello. Um, well, I'm John Liu, and uh, I've been a journalist and uh, a filmmaker, and I've been studying ecology now for about three decades. And I'm in Mendocino, California, the northern Pomo lands. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's exciting and fun. Thank you for having me. Maybe Janelle next. Thank you, John. Uh, my name is Janelle Luke. I am coming to you from Paradise, California, which is actually occupied Maidu and Concow lands. Uh, I am also a microbiologist. My uh, educational background is actually in medical microbiology. And I had the pleasure of going through Elaine Ingham's Soil Food Web School to get deeper into soil microbiology. And I'm currently the co-chair of the Campfire Restoration Project. And we'll let you take it away, Bob. All right. Thank you, Janelle. Thanks, everybody. Really glad to be here. My name is Bob Wilms, and I'm the executive director of the land, 160-acre retreat center in Mendocino County in the Navarro River watershed, which is traditional Northern Pomo land. Um, they had a settlement just over the river from us. And I also operate the Earth Program, which is, I'm the director of the Earth Program, which is a part of the uh, Unconditional Freedom Project, a nonprofit. And my background has nothing to do with ecology. <laughs> I just, um, um, I learned this trial by fire. And uh, so, yeah, just happy to be with you all and get to learn more today. Off to uh, Johnny down in LA. Hey, thank you, everyone. So my name is Johnny Allen. I've been a filmmaker most of my life and um, working also in nonprofit here in Los Angeles. Uh, the Tongva Gabrieleno lands, traditionally and um, otherwise now known as Hollywood, Long Beach, Malibu. Malibu borders on the Chumash. So um, I appreciate being here and I look forward to hearing from everyone today. Thanks so much. And um, we're going to have um, John D. Liu um, take us away with just the overarching theme of Hugh System Restoration Camps. Well, thanks so much. It's, it's so ha I'm so happy to have this opportunity to talk with you. And there's quite a lot I would like to say, but uh, I'll try to limit myself because it's easier to get me to start than it is to get me to stop. Um, but the ecosystem restoration camps are started with dreaming. I had been uh, documenting large scale ecosystem restoration for a very long time and working with the United Nations and the World Bank and different uh, governments on very large scale restoration. If you have the opportunity to see Hope in a Changing Climate or Green Gold or these other films, Lessons of the List Plateau or some of these other ones, please do. They're available online. And if you need additional assistance, you can ask me and I'll let you know how to find them. But um, they're also on Ecoflix now. I've been starting to put my films on Ecoflix if you want to look at them there. But um, I started dreaming a few years ago about people going camping and restoring the earth. And my father had always told me that I was sort of a dreamer and uh, that this was, you know, fantasy. I get a job, you know, act normal. And um, so I kind of didn't 
react when I first had the dream, but the dream kept coming back again and again. And so I finally wrote an essay called Earth Restoration Peace Camps, which was published in Permaculture Magazine. And when that happened, thousands of people and then tens of thousands of people said, well, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And some of them even said they were having the same dream. And so from there, that was, I think, in uh, 2016. And so in 2017, after a thousand people had joined, we, we started to make the first camp in Spain in the Altiplano. And in the second year, we created a second camp in, together with Via Organica in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico. And in the third year, there were 21 camps. And in the fourth year, there were 37 camps. And at the end of 2021, there were 50 camps. And there are now at least another 25 that are about to come on. So that'll take us to 75. And theoretically, we could end up with, with about 100 by the end of this year, because there's another 25 I know who are registering. So what's interesting about this is that what we're seeing is that people who have not necessarily been in the expert class or in the power uh, hierarchy, they actually have more of an opportunity to do restoration than experts or, or politicians or those in financial systems and so on. And this may even be, you'll see later, I hope Bob will talk to you about the Unconditional Freedom Program and some of the work that's going on here, which is involving uh, incarcerated people. And there's a group, I noticed that somebody's on from Uganda, there's a group of refugees in Uganda who are asking for, for help. And I think we really need to figure out how to make camps available to all of these people. And so the most important thing that I've been considering is exactly where are we at this time and what do we need to do with these camps because they're growing fast and people can do restoration work, but we're also seeing that the climate changes are happening and, and the, the consequences are happening very rapidly with drought, with wildfires, with, with extreme storms and with more, and, you know, potentially war. So we need to have peace. We need to collaborate together. We have this ability to, to restore the earth. And so that seems to be what we need to do. So I don't want to spend too much time because I think the camps are the most important, but I just wanted to tell you what I've been thinking about for the different camps. I, and what I've been noticing is there are four things that I've been focused on recently. One is um, creator spaces where if we can have for all the communities, the best tools, the best machine shops, then we can repair anything, we can pr make things there. And one of the things that we need to make is central kitchens. So central kitchens need to be in every community and feed the people who are hungry. So here at the land, there is a beautiful uh, love to table program. That's a fabulous program. But if we all create central kitchens, then we can also negotiate directly with the producers of organic and biodynamic food sources. So those producers, then we're able to affect what type of agriculture is, is, uh, used so we can say, well, we don't want chemicals. We don't want monoculture plowing. We want nutrient dense, organic and biodynamic food sources. And when we negotiate directly between the communities and the producers, the producers can get the highest price so they don't have to go into the wholesale and retail concepts, which just have middlemen and turnover and 
also are connected to this global transfer of stuff all over the planet. Instead, we can work with our local food producers and have the highest nutrient values and especially feed, take it out of the, of the concept of buying and selling stuff and just say everyone in our community is able to eat. You know, like if there's, if we have the ability to feed ourselves, but then there are other people out on the street with nothing to eat, well, let's feed them. And that's gonna be the cheapest way to deal with this problem and it's gonna make sure that they have the highest nutrient value. And that's going to bring them together in a strong community where they can contribute what they can do. So if they learn how to restore soils and restore the hydrological cycle and restore biodiversity, that's more valuable than them doing anything else. So the third thing that I've been thinking about is uh, cultural stages, because we don't want the idea of rest restoration to be a drudge activity. It's got to be fun. So let's all come together. And that's what I'm seeing in the camps is you got a lot of happy people who are eating together and playing music and who are playing volleyball. And they're putting in a few hours every day to restore the soils and the hydrology and the vegetation and the protect and encourage and increase the biodiversity. Well, that's exactly what we need to do. And so if we do that and we engage everyone, that's the highest value that we can create. There's one more, so creator spaces, central kitchens and cultural stages. And the, the, the fourth thing that I'm working on is something together with the weather makers and, and restoration in one of the most challenging areas, which is Egypt. So in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, we have two camps in Egypt there now. And, uh, and one of the things that we're seeing is that, well, there's not very much rainfall and it's the evaporation rates and the temperatures are extremely elevated. So could we make microclimates inside of eco oasis? And this is working with Dr. John Todd and the idea of creating microclimates. And I've been starting to see this as a magical door between human infrastructure and the horticulture and evolutionary succession that led to the earth support, life support systems. So if we can create microclimates, and basically that's what we're finding out. So we already have prototypes. Dr. John Todd has been working on this for decades. And basically it shows that, yeah, we can, we can recycle gray water. We can take seawater and passively desalinate it. We can massively grow uh, biomass and biodiversity in microclimates. And when we, when we do that, especially in these extreme places, then we have water, we have soils that we can generate and we have biodiversity. So we can start to use the, the microclimates in the eco oasis as the edge system and then continue to move from that edge and grow outside of the eco oasis. So if we have many different eco oasis and then they're, they're connected to one another so that they're lowering the surface temperatures, creating fertile soils, infiltrating and retaining more moisture and recycling and creating a canopy, which is holding moisture near the earth instead of allowing it to go into the upper atmosphere. That this is, this is what we can do now. And having lo living laboratories in six continents around the world and teaching people how to do this is more effective than going to a, a bunch of meetings and, and talking about the dangers of climate change. We need to understand what we know and we have to act on that. So that's what I wanted to say and to tell you that the ecosystem restoration camps are yours and they belong to everybody. Each of the camps are 
are self-organizing, self-governing, autonomous, but they're linked together in a network. And in this way, I think we can just, and we see that it's starting to happen in exponential growth rates. So we can just blanket the planet with ecosystem restoration camps. And there'll be another step after ecosystem restoration camps, like eco villages and permanent communities. But we need to learn how to live together uh, with compassion and p in peace and in collaboration. And we need to know how to control the hydrological cycle, the soil fertility and the biodiversity. So this is what we can do in our living laboratories throughout the world in ecosystem restoration camps. And what you're gonna hear from the campers and the camp coordinators now is what they're doing. Thanks so much. Beautiful, beautiful, wonderful vision of, of how this will spread organically through the world. Um, Janelle, please give us uh, an example from your, uh, from your local situation. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for the invitation to this. Um, I'm super excited and I have to say a little bit nervous. <laughs> um, but I'm really, yeah, I'm really excited to be able to share um, what we've been doing up here in Butte County, California. Uh, thanks to John's initiative and his inspiration. Um, so I am the co-chair of the Campfire Restoration Project. We just recently became an actual 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we are operating out of Paradise, California, which is occupied uh, Maidu and Concow land. And our mission <laughs> is promoting ecological stewardship through education, community action, and resource sharing. Um, so the Campfire Restoration Project, we're kind of a non-traditional sort of ecosystem restoration camp and we definitely have deep ties to that movement and maintain those to this day um, but we don't actually have a, a space that we have a permanent camp um, because of the devastation that Butte County has experienced in the last few years uh, primarily from the campfire which is our a uh, tragic namesake for our project, but also a reminder of where we came from and uh, what we're working towards changing for everyone's futures in this area. Um, we've also experienced the Bear Fire uh, from the North Complex and the, just last year, the Dixie Fire, which maxed out at almost a million acres of land burned and destroyed some small rural communities in the mountains as well. Uh, so we began, of course, in the wake of the campfire back in 2018. Um, it burned numerous communities in Butte County, uh, primarily Paradise, California. Uh, 40,000 plus homes destroyed. Tens of thousands of people were displaced from Paradise, Megalia, uh, Butte Creek Canyon, Concow and Yankee Hill. Um, and we are still very much feeling the effects uh, of that to this day. Uh, Paradise is under construction, but our population still only hits about 6,000 people. Um, so there have been a lot of unique challenges <laughs> associated with this. Um, and it's also created the model for our camp where we don't necessarily have a permanent home base because of the changing landscape and the heavy impacts and, you know, a lot of the destruction and, and the contamination that was happening afterwards, we couldn't actually be on site for doing this restoration work. Um, uh, initially, our project started kind of as an emergency response. Um, we, we didn't have, you know, these grandiose plans of environmental restoration at the time. I think it was just trying to figure out what needs were not being met in the moment. And pretty much what we determined was that there was a ton of potential contamination from the towns uh, and all the, you know, anthropic, uh, anthropogenic materials that had been destroyed in the fires. And especially because of the time of year that this occurred, um, the heavy winter rains happened almost immediately afterwards. So some of our first actions as the campfire restoration project were wattle deployment activities um, 
I think it might have something on the next slide. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I was wrong about that. Uh, but yeah, we began as an emergency response um, to environmental contamination. That was kind of our first impact we had in this area. Uh, our current approach has kind of evolved from that quite a bit. Uh, we're looking at more long-term restoration efforts in this area, and we have a ton of ways that we approach that. Um, as our mission statement says, you know, education, resource sharing, and community action are really our primary ways that we interact with our community. Um, we have tons of educational videos that we've put out um, on everything from gray water videos to uh, dealing with invasive plants on your property. Uh, resource sharing is something else and be that resources that we obtain as a 501c3 and directing those back into the community um, or sometimes even resources that we procure from the environment around here and share with folks or produce ourselves. Uh, community action kind of speaks for itself. Um, we have tons of opportunities where we bring in the community. Um, every event and activity that we host is free to anyone who's from our community and even from the broader community who come in from either ERC connections um, or some of our partnerships with other organizations. Uh, but I think really the primary driving force behind everything we do is definitely relationships. Um, you know, this all started as our relationship uh, with John and ecosystem restoration camps, and it has blossomed into quite a few other connections and not just with organizations and with people, but also with the land. Um, we have a very deep connection uh, with some local uh, TEK practitioners in our area. Uh, and we very much, you know, that's a very deep underlying value in our organization is taking into consideration what this land was before colonizers came to it. Um, and not only respecting that, but trying to share that knowledge and spread it with folks so they understand that there are better approaches uh, to land restoration, and also that those, you know, industrial colonial practices are what got us to this point where we're experiencing natural occurrences as these totally uh, devastating disasters. So, next slide. <laughs> um, so some of the biggest events that we've put on were ecosystem restoration camps. Our first step out of emergency response was an eco camp in the spring of 2019. Uh, we have since hosted two more. Our camps are typically one to two day events. Uh, people come, uh, we find a space locally in Butte County where we can host folks to come and camp out. Our most recent eco camp was actually on May Day of this year. Uh, we had over 100 people in attendance from all over the world. Um, we got to share all of our different ongoing projects with folks. Uh, we did field trips and helped do some land restoration in a property that was in the burn scar from the campfire. And we also did a ton of demonstrations of all of the different little aspects of our organization at Soul Sanctuary, which is typically our hub for most of our activities in Paradise, California. Next slide. <laughs> um, so this is what I was saying before. We began as kind of emergency response after the campfire. Uh, emergency waddle deployment seemed like something that was not getting enough attention in our opinions. Uh, which I deeply agreed with as a soil scientist. Um, there was a lot of contamination going on. Not everything is recalcitrant. And with the way we get almost monsoonal type moisture in California in the wintertime and the steep grades and the mountainous terrain, um, there was a lot of runoff occurring. So we distributed thousands and thousands of feet of compost socks and wattles that were all donated to us. Uh, some of this was with the help um, of Cal OES and the California Conservation Corps. 
And we not only perform these activities after the campfire in Butte Creek Canyon, but we also provided this service um, to folks after the bear fire up in Berry Creek. Um, and in that instance, we were actually successful in being able to deploy those materials before the winter rains started. Um, there are a few folks who came out to this area after the bear fire that I also had the chance to work with. There are some professors from Chico State who did a ton of sampling of surface water runoff. And I don't know if they have results of those uh, tests and samples yet, but I'd love to be able to share that information at some point. They were testing in a community that we actually did a wattle deployment demonstration in. And I was also able to work with a group called Co-Renewal to do a biofiltration experiment in that same area where we were inoculating wattles with different uh, biological elements, uh, different mushroom myceliums and native microbial communities. Um, and we're also still waiting for results back, but that's information that we'll have. And I'd love to see, you know, how these types of efforts are actually affecting uh, runoff and contamination post wildfire. Next slide. <laughs> uh, so native plants and trees have been also a huge focus for our organization. Um, you know, after a major wildfire in our area, we uh, a lot of these lands have been heavily logged in the past, uh, a lot of coniferous trees and a lot of uh, not quite monocultures, but a lot of uh, cohorts of trees, you know, not a lot of age differential. There was a lot of areas that were left completely denuded. And so planting trees has been a primary activity that we perform every year. Uh, we try to stick to native plants. Uh, however, we have done some fruit tree giveaways as well because producing food in our community is very important right now. There wasn't a ton of farming since we are in the California foothills, even pre-fire, but we are in a complete food desert after the fire. Um, there, you know, we have farmers markets, folks who come up here to bring produce to our communities because nothing is being produced locally. Um, so fruit trees are an easy way to start creating some more abundance. And it's something that a lot of people are comfortable with tending um, and something that they can care for pretty easily. So tree planting, next slide. <laughs> uh, so these are some of our accomplishments that we're pretty excited about over the past few years since we've been in operation. I do have to say since COVID, um, you know, we, we kind of cut back on a lot of our activities because most of our events and things were never online. They were all in person. That's also something that's kind of important to us. And it's better and easier for us to engage people when we can speak with them a little more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, there was a lot of trauma after the fires around here. And we found that Oftentimes people came to our events, not even necessarily for the content, but just to be in community and be able to speak with people who experience the same thing as themselves and maybe even to meet strangers who've been through the same thing because it can be easier to communicate with people who aren't quite so deep in it with you. Uh, but these are some of our activities that we have accomplished. Uh, seed sharing and collecting is part of our resource sharing. It's an activity that we typically collaborate with, um, with Chico TEK, which I'll talk a little bit more about as one of our ongoing projects. Um, we create educational videos, which are available on our YouTube channel online. I'm not sure if they're all there yet, that's uh, currently being worked on, but they should all be there soon. Uh, these range from uh, gray water system installation to dealing with invasive plants on your properly, particularly broom species, as that's a big issue in our area. Um, and I believe, oh, and the other one that I am currently aware of is uh, planting and tending to blue oak trees, which is a staple tree for indigenous folks in our area. And it's also um, a really indicative species in our area. They're not found in many places. Uh, so, it's really important to us to promote their, their care and 
uh, spreading their, their range in this area. Uh, we installed the first permitted gray water system in Paradise, California. Uh, gray water systems are legal in California, but municipalities have their own laws about them. Uh, again, this is kind of resource sharing or resource conservation. Um, obviously, anyone who lives in California is aware of our, our water crisis issues and, you know, trying to promote defensible space, but save people money and, you know, show them that they can create this on their own properties and not have to spend a fortune in infrastructure to do it. Uh, you know, accessible education and accessible models for people to be able to retain their resources, retain their water, uh, and revitalize the land that they're living on um, is really what we strive for. So yeah, we worked with the town of Paradise, uh, the first permitted gray water system. They had documentation about how to do this and no one had ever tried to pull a permit before. So they were extremely supportive. Um, and since then we've installed two more gray water systems and have several people who've been inquiring about it. So we've, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, and then again, talking about water, uh, we've built hundreds of yards of swales for water catchment um, and spreading water on the land in a more natural way to recharge and replenish the hydrological cycles. Next slide. <laughs> so our two primary ongoing projects are working with Chico TEK. Uh, Ali Meters Knight is an absolutely incredible Maidu woman who works in Chico, California. She has a decades long restoration project, which is a park called Verbena Fields. Uh, it used to be a construction materials dump that the city granted to her to restore. Um, it's a beautiful, lush, riparian ecosystem now. The waterways have been recharged. Uh, They're full of native plants. And she teaches folks about all of the different uses of these plants. Um, the last Tuesday of every month, we help sponsor a native plant walk where Allie takes people through Verbena Fields. They do seed collection. Uh, she shows them how the indigenous folks use different plants at different times of year, how to manage plants. Um, so that's been an ongoing project that we help support. There's some information if you would like to contact them directly and see some of the other projects that they're working on. I highly recommend it. <laughs> Allie is a total powerhouse and a wealth of knowledge um, and a pretty, a pretty incredible woman. So, uh, and then my final ongoing project that I saved for last, because this is where I like to nerd out, is Paradise Community Compost. Um, uh, the state of California recently passed laws saying that we have to divert 75% of our organic waste from landfills in the next couple of years. SB 1383, uh, we were granted a uh, funding opportunity through Cal Recycle and a group called the California Alliance for Community Composting. And we are one of about 80 community composting sites being funded through this grant all over California. Um, their objective is to figure out primarily ways that we can divert food waste from landfills. Um, so this has been kind of unique. This is not something that I spent a lot of time working with. Um, I didn't use a lot of food waste in my composting beforehand. So it's, it, it's been a challenge. <laughs> um, but thanks to some of my microscope skills that I learned from Elaine, I've been able to monitor our compost um, and make sure that we're creating a really uh, quality material that we in turn can share with our community. Um, so Paradise Community Compost has been a really great opportunity for us to kind of spread information about soil building and soil health in our area. Uh, I have to say that um, it was very unfortunate, you know, I was working with the soil food web um, as a student before the campfire. And it was almost impossible to get anyone interested in soil health. I would start talking about soil and people would just shut down. Um, after the fire and all of the studies that were being done on soil and water, um, a lot of people started getting very concerned. And I, it's 
so unfortunate that it took a total disaster for people, you know, to start thinking about this. But I think we have an extremely unique opportunity where people are open to new ideas and they're listening. And I think it's really important that we share what we're able to do and take the opportunity to show people how we can improve things very easily with resources that are already available to us. Um, so now every time I bring up soil, you know, no matter where I am, someone is asking me, you know, what contaminants are still in the soil? Is it safe to plant things on my property? Um, so I think this was all really in good time that we can now also produce this material uh, for our community. So uh, I think we have one more slide. Uh, these are just some things that we always ask of people when they come to our events. And I thought it was something that would be nice to share with everyone. These are our values, things that we want people to be thinking about no matter where you are and what you're doing. Um, always try to learn about the tribal land you live on. You know, who were the people who lived there or are still currently living there? Um, you know, it's extremely important to connect with indigenous folks if possible especially when you're in the realm of land restoration and stewardship. Um, they were here first <laughs> and they were doing an amazing job, you know, before these areas were colonized. And we really need to start understanding the destruction that's been caused from improper land management practices. Um, build relationship with the space you live in, you know, observation is critical in any type of scientific endeavor. Um, you can learn so much just by being involved with the land you're living on, uh, watching where the water goes, watching how the plants grow, you know, watching how the environment evolves over time. You know, that's one of the first things we tell people after a fire and they're trying to go back to their land. We tell them for that first year, just watch, see what comes back, see where things are moving. You know, when the land is bare like that, it's a great opportunity to really see the contours and see how everything is working um, and take some time to, you know, plan and be really conscientious about your actions. Uh, learn about grassroots organizations. Collaboration has been everything for us and nonprofits have been doing incredible work in our area um, and are always willing to talk to you, even if we're off the clock and at the grocery store. <laughs> um, Take action on your own land and please, uh, you know, consult the proper authorities and resources when doing so. And then get involved with ecosystem restoration camps. Um, I'm sure all of us are happy to bring in members and volunteers uh, in any capacity that you're capable of being involved, even if it's just coming to these webinars uh, and getting to meet folks and asking questions. And our last slide is just some contact information. Um, <laughs> well, I think that's all I have. Hopefully I'm not too much over time. <laughs> that was wonderful, Janelle. Thank you so much. And I'm excited to hear from, from Bob next. All right, Sammy queued up. We've, uh, part of our interesting Zoom journey this morning is um, some presentation sort of technical stuff. Um, so we'll wait a second here while we get my presentation queued up and then while we're doing that i can just say janelle that was awesome it was so inspiring to to hear about what you guys are doing there and and um i think one of the the cool things is um you guys have have really put in the work to take a, a damaged ecosystem that that has really you know uh, manifested in, you know, in ways that we're all seeing these days um, in the most extreme ways. And uh, we've been really fortunate here on the land, um, which is, as I said earlier, we're a property that's 160 acres um, in Northern California in uh, the Navarro River watershed, which is in the Southern portion of Mendocino County, which is historic, uh, traditionally Northern Poma land. And uh, can you change the slide? This is a, a, a pretty topographic or, you know, a drone photo of the property. So you see we've got about 25 acres of, of grassland 
Um, that is definitely not an evolutionary outcome, as my friend John Liu pointed out. And, um, and you know, it's right in the middle of, um, we've got about a mile of the Navarro River. You can kind of see a little bit of it down in the left-hand corner. And um, there's about 100 acres of timber forest, um, oak woodlands, um, some old growth redwood. Um, and then we have a two and a half acre garden that we've developed over the years as well. Um, thank you. <laughs> and then there's, um, and you know, so when we got to this property, my, um, a group of friends of mine and I um, moved here five years ago and we really didn't know anything about, you know, really anything environmental. Um, I used to go in the summers, I'd go to Lake Tahoe or, you know, other places. I loved hiking and swimming in rivers and lakes, um, but I, I really had no clue about ecology. And um, so this is a little bit about how we've learned and, you know, and come to come to know some things and, um, and then started to, you know, to put in some work that we can share with others. Slide change, please. Um, so as you can see, you know, when we first got here, you know, we were confronted with moving parts of, you know, managing a property of this size in a retreat center. And so, you know, you have pipes breaking and water systems that you need to figure out how to operate. And, um, you know, this one operates on solar system you can change slides again. And then, um, and then you start to, you know, in your spare time, you start to discover the natural features. Um, this is the Nav Navarro River, probably in the um, late spring. And so there's still water in it. Um, there's no snow runoff in this river. So, you know, it's spring fed and rain, um, rain fed. And, you know, so it really is similar to a lot of rivers where you have very high flows in the, um, in the winter and spring and then low trickles as you head into the fall slide. And, um, and so then one of the things is, you know, when we got here, the property had, um, the property had been owned by a billionaire um, as kind of a, um, a bunker, you know, that he bought in 2003 to, um, you know, to avoid the apocalypse. And, uh, and he lost interest after a couple of years and just did some bare maintenance. So when we took it over, we had a garden that had just run completely fallow and you know although we didn't know a lot about um nature and living in a rural property we knew that we wanted this garden to come back to life sorry i don't have before and after photos but it looked a little bit more like a moon landscape than this um, this was after a couple of years of planting and um kind of a cool coincidence is um one of the groups that owned the property before us um back in the late 80s and 90s were all trained at the Findhorn. And so this garden of ours is um, was designed in a medicine wheel shape. And so we'll, we'll see an aerial of it a little bit later, but it's pretty beautiful. Um, next slide. And then um, one of the other funny things is, you know, we, we created this property to be a retreat center that was more along the lines of what Esalen was in its beginning, um, having teachers from all kinds of different um, modalities, whether it's Zen Buddhism or a teacher that taught um, the early Aramaic language version of, of the Bible or constellation therapy. And, um, and we thought animals were cute. And so we got all these animals. We wanted to do goat yoga. So we got these little pygmy goats. Um, and, and then those cute animals that, you know, that we treated as pets, you know, and we've got, you see our mini cow Cliff. Well, he's not mini, he's a thousand pound steer. Once he became a thousand pound steer and started acting like a puppy dog and running up to you at full speed, we really started to rethink our whole relationship with animals. <laughs> uh, next slide. And um, you might be able to, let's see if we can play a little bit of that, um, the fire video, Sammy, if you can hop in there. We're gonna play a little bit of a video that we produced. Um, it'll be about, it's about 56 seconds. I'll, I'll cue you. We all came from the city, so we had never been on a property like this before. Surrounded by trees, a river, 
redwoods, an open meadow. Fire was the last thing on our minds. It didn't even cross my mind. <laughs> I had no idea about fire. The belief was that if we put enough work into the land, then the land would be happy, the land would be safer. We started talking to all of the people we knew that were experts or had some level of mastery. Our attitude and our behavior around fire has changed here in the last five years. It's gone from panic, anxiety, fear, more to, I'd say, friendship. So it's gone from fear to friendship. That's good. Um, so, yeah, so this is, I think, a good, um, well, it's a good example of some of the video work we're doing, one. And, um, and it's also reflective of, you know, of how we learned about things, you know, um, we were, we've been super fortunate that, you know, we have not had a fire come through our property. Um, we did have one start next door and we're super fortunate and, you know, and it was a panicked scene. Literally, we had every car on the property lined up, ready to evacuate fire agencies coming on the property. I was acting um, you know, I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off. Um, and, you know, and, and we had a house fire early in, in where, where, you know, I was fumbling even to get the fire hose out. And, um, and so, you know, you start really the, the first stage of us being in nature and on this property was, um, was the stage of reaction. You know, we were just reacting to everything. And, um, and we've stuck with it and, you know, and as we've, um, we've applied our attention, our curiosity to these environmental forces that are around us and started talking to people, um, we started to learn a lot and, you know, and so with fire, it started with the fire chief. And then, you know, we started to read a little bit about how the native Americans used fire to, you know, to cultivate their lands and, um, and then we started experimenting with it. And, um, and since, um, we started, we've, we haven't done a ton of burning. We've burned part of seven acres, but we've done an understory clearing in about 15 acres, um, and participated in community burns as well. Slide. And, uh, it, <laughs> you can go to one. Uh, well, maybe we'll just, maybe that's just doing its own thing. But anyways, while this, the slides, uh, oh, thank you. The next one is, yes, the Apple say <laughs> she had to switch from video to slides. Thanks for being patient. Um, so we have apples here and, you know, and, and one of, one of the things that we started to notice on the property while we were operating this retreat center and all these retreats is that we had all these fruit trees and the apples were falling to the ground and rotting. Maybe, you know, we'd eat like a hundred apples, you know, in a season out of 10,000. And, you know, and part of our, you know, part of our service um, culture is, you know, is we feel like it's, it's important for us to, to share what we have. Um, cause we are actually blessed in, I mean, we're, we're blessed in this property and having a place to live and, um, and this property is abundant. And, um, and so the, the philosophy is that you, you empty what's full and you fill what's empty. And so we felt like it was important for us to start using everything that we could, um, and sharing it with others. And, um, and so slide we created this nonprofit that um, is called Free Food. And Free Food actually came before the Unconditional Freedom Project, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But um, Free Food was was this concept that, um, that I'm trying to read, um, you know, really about restoring dignity, um, connecting us through preparing and enjoying a meal together. And, and so, you know, we, we ended up, of you know, at first we were making pies and stuff that we could share with neighbors. And then, you know, and then we actually brought all those, these apple crisps to uh, the Tenderloin San Francisco and started 
um, found a place that we could serve a restaurant that was closed that we could serve them in and then created a pop-up restaurant. And the idea was like, Hey, we are, we're all actually the same. You know, it doesn't matter if you find yourself in, you know, in the, the position of being houseless or if you're incarcerated, but we are literally all the same and, you know, and solving the problems that we're faced with, you know, on this planet are going to come from us connecting and building community um, together um, to start to, to learn what life is really about, you know, and, and that includes us being part of um, the ecology of this planet. And so free food was a way for us to start building connections with um, with people maybe that have been forgotten or, you know, or passed over, you know, by um, our, our mass culture. Um, next slide, please. And, uh, and then, you know, and then on the land, we came across the, the movie Kiss the Ground. And, uh, and really, we, you know, as I said before, we, we didn't know anything about ecology. And, um, and so this was a really great primer into what soil means to the environment and to ecology. And, you know, it started, to, it totally um, inspired us uh, to the point where we reached out to John um, and emailed him. And then we reached out to Ray Archuleta and um, we really accelerated our engagement with, um, with the land and, you know, and, and the natural systems that are on this property and then started talking to any, everyone that we could um, whether it's the local RCD or, you know, um, or neighbors or the fire department. Next slide, please. And, um, yeah, so like I said, we started healing the soil. You can skip this one, go to the, go to the next. Um, and then, um, well, we were going to have a video here, but I think y'all kind of, it's, it's pretty cool clip. Um, hopefully we can make it available to some of you at some point um or i can post a link to it in the chat but the um the essence is you know we really started to gain um through our you know our education with with john and ray and some of the other people that we've met um we started to really see that um you know the way that we've farmed and the way that we've clear cut you know, large areas of land um, has has disrupted um, the natural hydro hydrological cycle and the system's functions, and so and then there's uh you know and there's a butterfly effect. So what we do here on the land, what we do in Anderson Valley is gonna you know as part of you know is going to um, affect the weather systems just like what happens in the midwest is going to affect the weather systems you know some some place you'll have a mega drought like we've been experiencing here in california for the last 20 years in other places you're going to have um, flooding and so we started to think about well how can we take what we're learning here on the land and you know and share it with others and become a, you know, a force that contributes to the solution um, that we're talking about. Next slide. And you can skip that one. It's also a video. <laughs> um, and so we developed the Earth Program. And the Earth Program is, um, is part of the Unconditional Freedom Project. And I suppose it's probably a good time to talk about the Unconditional Freedom Project and how we arrived at this point. Um, basically, during the um, from during the pandemic, um, we started making masks. Like a lot of people, um, those that sheltered in place at the land um, made masks, and then we we quickly saw that prisons needed masks, and so we started facil facilitating those. And then we also have always had a dream to have um, have some connection with. Um, the prison population. So we wrote a book called The Art of Soul Making and, um, and reached out to the Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla and w was like, hey, you know, we have this concept of creating, um, helping inmates create monasteries in their prison cells. Would you, you know, would you be interested in working with us? And, you know, and we were shocked that 24 hours or less than 24 hours later, they started engaging us with this program and 
now the prison monastery program and the art of soul making book, um, which really um, gives inmates the ability to start to recognize themselves as creative forces, as you know, as brilliant people that you know that have um, mis have made some missteps in life, and you know, but but how do you remove the shame and start to actually um, value the innate creativity and power that you have as a human being. And that program now has over a thousand students in over 70 institutions across the country. And, and so we started to blend our work on the earth at the land with this prison monastery project and, you know, and free food and, you know, created this ecology of interaction with the outside world. Um, that um, through these programs. And, um, and so let's go to the next slide. Um, and so the, the vision is that the, the land really is the, the center for all of these programs, for free food, for unconditional freedom, for the earth program. And um, because we're so blessed that like the land is actually a, a relatively functioning um, system still. You know, we have a lot of the forest intact, even though it's been clear cut. Um, you know, the, the river to some degree, although it went dry last year in the drought, um, is still, you know, working to some degree. You know, we're not desertified to the extent that, you know, the San Joaquin Valley is um, in certain places or, you know, any of the many places that y'all are familiar with across the world and uh and so you can, as i was saying on the left hand side of the screen you can see the the medicine wheel shape of the mandala garden what we call and then um the other the food production side on the other side of the garden um and so from from this place you know the 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 land and unconditional freedom project have developed, um, we're developing an educational platform where we can teach all of our programs, whether you know it's the art of soul making or the earth program or creating opportunities for people to plug into free food um, from this place on the land. And, uh, and, and as a result of this, you know, we started to think about um, how do you really like you know, there's so, how do you build community? And one of the, one of the places that we had already started to build this community is in the prison system through the art of soul making. And so with John, we launched a prison botanical sanctuary, which is an ecosystem restoration project at the Mendocino County Jail uh, about two months ago. And uh, so I'm gonna play you a little video um, that shows some of the interaction between John, myself, um, Sheriff Matt Kendall at the Mendocino County Sheriff's Department and um, uh, Kate, who's the head of the restorative justice program and the inmates. Go ahead and play that, Sandy, thanks. I think what's interesting here is that we have multiple systems which are uh, impacted so the the social systems and the and the emotional and spiritual life of the of the inmates and potentially also the guards and then you have the landscape and so in a way what we're seeing is that the human consciousness is is affecting the landscape so if this turns into a flourishing beautiful place then i think we're going to see that same occurrence with the spiritual and emotional and physical health of the of the prisoners that would be wonderful yeah and so the way that we're going to do that is by creating a botanical sanctuary here and um, also what we would refer to as an ecosystem restoration project so we're going to spend a little bit of time observing what's here and then think about what we can bring here as part of this botanical sanctuary that will become a hub for creating and propagating some of the most important trees that can then go out into the community and start to rehabilitate landscapes in the surrounding community here in Mendocino County.
not only can you do this important work for the society, but the people who study this are going to have something that is useful for the rest of their lives and that, that the society and the civilization absolutely need. Well, and here's the other thing. You can go to the store and you can buy something. But that something can be taken away, it can be lost, it can be broken. Education can never be stolen from you. And I think that one of the things that these guys oftentimes are lacking in is hope and education. You know, for me, it's personal. I, I care about our town. I care about the, the community here. I want it to be safer. And I believe that the way to make our community safer is through restorative justice in jails rather than punitive justice or retributive justice. So, I mean, it's been a fun experience. You know, I like coming out here. I like coming out here tending to the, the bees and the, the chickens. Makes you feel a little bit more free and um, I want to say, um, I don't feel like an inmate. The second component of the restorative model that is essential is skill building. People need to learn new ways to earn a living when they're in jail, in my opinion, that are you know, lucrative and essential to our community. So the restorative model needs to have skill building programs, whether that be you know, a metal fabricator program or construction. I was in the field doing and documenting the restoration of this vast area in China and then later all over the world. And what I found as I progressed was that there are principles which are the same everywhere. We depend on evolutionary succession. Mm -hmm. We can come up with the shared intention to do it together. Mm -hmm. And that's really where the community fits and that's where these people then become essential part of the community because nobody has as much time to or or focus and this will change their perspective change their lives i know that when i started to study ecology it changed my life and i think it could work for many 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 other people to start studying this observation is necessary to understand it. You, you have to look at the situation and do what, you have to read the landscape and, and understand what na nature would do. It's the ideal outcome. Well, I mean, I do want to get the water to come back. Right? So, I mean, if, if what you're saying is, you know, what, what, what you're saying happened and, and how it did work all together, I mean, I wouldn't mind doing it over this way because we need it. All right, that's it. Thank you, Sammy. And then we'll go to, I think we go back to the, the last slide, which or close to the last one, which has the contact info on it. And then, yeah, so just to, to, to wrap things up, um, the, um, sorry, I'm just getting a little bit of power while I, <laughs> while we talk here. Um, the, the thing with the, the the Mendocino County Jail, you know, Warren Brush, who many of you may know, the permaculturist, said something really interesting, which is, in new systems, all the energy comes from the margins, and so, and I, I think whether you're talking about, um, you know, the campfire project or our project, it's it's really looking at how can we build community, and you know, and the prisons was one place where you know where we just saw. A, a resource that was being under is being underutilized, and um, and so we wanted to interact with it, and it's been really beautiful getting to see um, their engagement. And we just hired, we got the first grant for that project, and just hired hired our you know our first full time gardener and coordinator for the project, and we're working on a partnership with um, with the Archangel Ancient Tree Archive. Um, to provide some really amazing tree starts for our nursery 
um, and are working on all kinds of partnerships with, you know, with government and local government and state agencies and hopefully national agencies to, you know, to continue this work. And uh, so if you're interested in learning more, feel free to um, email me. Um, it's bob at the land, the dash land dot us. And of course you can feel free to, um, the Unconditional Freedom website has a lot of really great information. The, the land, um, we haven't updated the website in about, since we started, so <laughs> it doesn't have a lot of our Earth stuff in it, but um, coming soon. And so, thanks, thanks a lot, everybody. Appreciate being here, and and uh, look forward to you know to more with, especially with the soil food web. Thanks so much, Bob. It was a very inspiring. Love the videos, mm. Johnny. You 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 have to follow all these folks. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i'm so impressed and i um i'll start my my screen share um because there's a lot of kinship here i believe it would be this how does that look is that working looks great okay i um I have to say, you know, I've been a, a filmmaker, like mainly um, for most of my life, um, doing effects direction and working in the film industry in various capacities. But at a certain point in 1993, um, in the wake of the Rodney King riots, um, you know, which was just major unrest in Los Angeles due to yet another unpunished police brutality and um so yes i find kinship with you in in this bob because uh at that time i started uh getting into the nonprofit work and we started a garden training program for teenage prisoners called offspring urban farms and that was funded by the usda and um considered a success, you know, because rival gangsters were cooperating to produce uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, which was unheard of at the time. And um, they saw the parallels in their lives about being destructive versus being um, nourishing. And uh, a number of these guys uh, took their skills on the outs and um, that is a good feeling. Um, but I'll tell you, I kind of had a long path getting to this in the sense that I've always been looking for some kind of way to assuage my seed of discontent and cognitive dissonance, if you will, about uh, the, the, the life we're living and um, seeing that it's, you know, the American dream, they call it that because you got to be asleep to believe it. Um, so I, uh, was approached by a friend in 2008, uh, to start a, um, a pack to get this guy, um, Obama elected. And we did that. We raised money and we made award-winning ads, um, that I'm, uh, you know, proud to say made measurable difference in the impact and we won you know uh award winning in 2008 and 2012 but um in some ways that just left me disillusioned about what politics has to offer and i just felt the need and the desire to get traction and not wait around for uh political agents to take action. So um, it was about that time that a friend, a uh, neighbor who became a good friend offered to uh, start a nonprofit here in our canyon. So yeah, I'm calling out to you from Hollywood, California, the unceded territory of the Tongva Gabrielino. And our canyon is actually the one under the Hollywood sign. So it's it's very visible and it's, um its needs are the same as everywhere in the sense that there's a great sense of um yeah disconnection 
from each other and from the land. Um, so starting something like this, where we bring a community together to pick the fruit that exists already in the canyon. Um, and, you know, this bounty went to uh, and continues to go to the uh, nonprofits and after school program for more disinherited parts of Los Angeles and about a ton of fruit each time we pick with volunteers and everybody just, yeah, just gets a lot of juice out of it. And we process the food together in these pop up kitchens in the street. Do I need to enlarge the picture? Is that full screen? Okay. Um, yeah, so that's about the time in 2016 that we started uh, another nonprofit called The Birdhouse. And this is really just to dive in and address the question of how do we live a life that the planet Earth now demands? It's a, it's a, it's a kind of ontological question, but it, it was grounded in, um, well, I've been a gardener. I've been a, all my life pretty much, and a musician. And these things kind of came together in something that we called uh, arts and ecology. And um, the birdhouse is dubbed as a a hub of exchange for those attracted to caring for the land and people through arts and ecology. And um, it was in 2022, no, 2020, that I met John Liu, and we were invited to become the first urban ecosystem restoration camp. And, uh, you know, I consider that an honor and a responsibility and just a real pleasure to be associated with people around the world doing this work. And um, let's see, this picture shows the sort of before state of the birdhouse, uh, which is uh, a property that we acquired in 2015. And it was covered in I'm afraid that uh, Johnny has frozen. Yeah, it would seem that way. Oh, in fact, I think we lost him out of the... Are oh, we are you back with us, Johnny? I hope so. I guess that dropped. Should I screen share again? Where are we at? Yeah, let's try that. Is there any way we're going to enlarge the picture? It's true for all this. I don't know how to enlarge the picture, so I'm going to screen share again. Thanks for hanging with us, everybody. I think Zoom has been experiencing some global issues today. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah, we can see this picture of your How's backyard. This? Can you hear me? You're hello, on. Yes. Hello. Yes, yeah. we hear you. Yeah. John, I hear you. I don't hear you anymore. You're frozen again. Well, I think while we're waiting to see if um, if we can sort out these technical issues, I, I think we could jump into one of our first questions um, for the panelists, uh, which was how do these camps incorporate some of the local indigenous ecological knowledge base of the places that you're restoring. So does anybody feel like they would like to speak to that with their project? And then we'll see if we can get Johnny back on. Well, I, I might uh, might take a short stab at that. Um, basically, since all the camps are self-organizing, autonomous and self-governing, it's, you know, they're, they're different places. So, in Egypt, there are Egyptians, and in in Guatemala, there are Guatemalans. In Brazil, there are Brazilians, and in India, there are Indians, etc. So, I think the indigenous. What what we want to do is to realize that we're all indigenous to the planet, and that those cultures that have been 
working closely with nature, they're our teachers and we want to learn from them. And so if we can build uh, living laboratories throughout the world and we welcome indigenous people to share their wisdom and knowledge with us, then that's great. And if they create their own, their own uh, camps, and then we can all go there too. <laughs> so that's my contribution to that question. Excellent. Thank you, John. We can circle back around to that um, question uh, for the other panelists as well. But I think, Johnny, we may have fixed your bandwidth issue. I hope so. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Okay, well, let me continue. And if we drop out, Sammy can take over. Um, so really, uh, our goal has been to increase the biodiversity, the biomass and the accumulated organic matter of uh, the basin that we live in. And, um, you know, it's just been a beautiful thing to understand the mechanisms, if you could call it that. I'd like to call it more like nested systems that allow for us to actually impact the hydrological cycle in a positive way. And, um, but I, I have to say that when being in a uh, urban center like this, we were really uh, faced with a kind of different set of problems. We don't have large landscapes. Um, but one thing we learned from the um, from the Hollywood Orchard and from everything we're doing at the birdhouse is you don't have to own the land in order to steward it. You don't have to um, to pay for it to be able to take care of it. And uh, the real harvest for us is 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 the people and their hearts and minds to shift this sort of un claimed undeclared um, despair about the future and what it holds. And I've moved from resignation to just a, 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 a place of possibility and action because I understand now through soil and through uh, all of what it takes to plant and to maintain um, lush and vibrant landscapes that impact on the uh, rainfall and the hydrological cycle is just really exciting. So I think our job is to train folks um, and give them an opportunity to, um, to uh, restore or to actually invent for themselves a, a sense of possibility. So, um, creating a natural bridge between the hearts and, and, and minds and is, is really coming through, you know, learning to tell new stories about who we are and um, where we're headed as a species. I'm gonna play this little video, which is a moment of us, um, part of our classes are uh, singing and performance and storytelling and this is a moment from uh, the Band of Singers where we're um, really making that connection between the, the heart and the mind. And I think singing does, it's a natural bridge between the mind and the heart. And I think that that's what we're really here to do. Yes, that was Jessica. And I, um, Jessica is uh, the director of um, education at the birdhouse and these are other team players. This is my wife, Bella, and we're considered generators. Uh, Cameron is the ecological program manager. Mesa is, with the baby is the director of the uh, band of singers and Andrea is the uh, arts and culture program manager. And we have a sort of secondary team of media people and uh, this woman on the bottom right is Lucy, who is an uh, intern garden, gardener, uh, thanks to a uh, grant through the uh, Ecosystems Restoration Camps. We've been talking a lot about the importance of uh, indigenous relationships, and we are very fortunate to know Lazaro Arvizu, who is uh, our cultural advisor and leads us in learning groups and, uh, you know, the whole what we call decolonizing our minds. Um, 
and it's just um yeah it's a privilege to to one of the things we study is is what it means to kuyam to be a guest to be good guests on this land and uh to steward it as if we belong to it and it belongs to us in that way of care so we're we're working on creating a culture of care in everything we do here um we have classes and um a lot of um well permaculture we you know blend like action work on the soil with um the work of joanna macy uh for any of you are familiar with that active hope and um alternative economics and really just looking upstream for root causes of things um This is bamboo that we grow in forests around here, little mini forests of bamboo, which is timber source for us, as well as uh, a super fast growing carbon sink. Uh, we've adopted the um, alternative measures, if you will, of the four returns, which came from the Common Lands Foundation. Really, if you're not familiar, it's uh, instead of just looking at the bottom line in our lives as the financial return, we also look at the ecological return, the social return, and the inspirational return that it can uh, bring to the people that we're working with. I also want to acknowledge Kiss the Ground. The Soil Advocacy course has been a big breakthrough for me uh, right after doing the permaculture design course back in 2016. And um, just really gave me a basic understanding of uh, soil, the uh, ultimate purpose in a sense of doing the work that we do is to um, lower the ambient temperatures to cool our regions. Doing that by tending to the soil, planting anything that will and everything that will grow. I know uh, that flies in the face of some of the um, folks who um, believe that we should only be planting natives, but I, uh, I tend to believe that at this point, growing anything fast that will create canopy is, um, is, is something that we will not regret. And um, so, yeah, the understanding the water cycle, the soil, and I just, I say that uh, these things that I've learned, the inspiration of seeing John's work in the Los Plateau and others who are doing epic work like that is, has, has been sort of the glomalin in my life, you know, the, uh, the thing that glues it all together. Um, I'm gonna play this video for you. Is that showing? Yeah, okay. It'll take seven minutes. Of Earth House, the first urban ecosystem restoration camp right here in Hollywood, California. Is that loud enough? I think you can just see the Hollywood sign behind me through the trees. <laughs> this is the hub of the birdhouse where we hold classes and workshops. The garden is where we grow fruits and vegetables and herbs, but it also serves as an oasis of connection, a sanctuary in the city. We honor the Gabrieleno Tongva Nation as the original caretakers of this land, now known as Los Angeles. They successfully tended this land for thousands of years, and they're still praying for it and protecting it. We join them and bringing it back to its fertile and vibrant state where people are cooperating with nature and each other. The birdhouse is regenerating land under the Hollywood sign. Okay. Growing gardens on neighbors' lots, sharing the bounty creating a uh, culture of
badly compacted when we put in this really extensive retaining wall but we're here with a group of volunteers we're trying to increase the water infiltration the amount of living roots in the soil so we're excited to track the progress of this thing as we move along Lisa Pullman leads the band of singers. Every plant and every animal was a sibling, a spirit, or a god. The world was sacred and treated as such. The band of singers is really a driving force in the community storytelling and singing go hand in hand to generate a culture of care and biophilia. And we take a mosaic approach to enrolling neighbors with little plots of land, backyards, and some cases up to an acre, which are all part of a mosaic of parcels that we steward here by permission from the owners. Mary Lou's is the first. We've been gardening here for five years now. And this year, there's going to be a focus on food and fruit production. interested in kind of what happens at that intersection of arts and ecology, how they can inform each other and how they're mutually reinforcing ideas, um, trying to take a holistic approach to, you know, culture, not just looking at restoration or conservation as work on one hand, and then arts is this totally distinct thing on the other side. So as John said, the Eco Restoration Project that we're, we're rolling out this next year, we call the Birdhouse Urban Eco Restoration Initiative. It's a mouthful, so we call it WETI. But what we want to do with that project is identify what's possible to develop in an urban setting. So we have all of these sites will be a representation of what's possible in one community. So one parcel will be uh, urban orchard. Uh, the other will be an urban farm. Um, and so, and then we have the wildlife corridor. So the idea is to have a demonstration of, again, how can this LA Green Plan really roll out and how can the community itself uh, be a part of identifying the solution? This is the Pullmans, a number of little plots on their land where we focus on herbs, medicinal herbs for the apothecary. After we graduated from this intensive course in plant medicine, Jessica and I started the community apothecary we host ceremonies and classes. We also have the chance to harvest the plants together, the plants that we would use for our tea circles and our hydrosomes and tinctures and salves. Holly Ridge is one of the more iconic sites in view of the Hollywood sign. It's probably everybody on the planet. Know. Hollywood's an incubator for the images and ideas that shape cultural way of thinking. So we're doing this work here because it's potent with possibility. <laughs> People around here see a plot of land next door that they have known always 
to be a dry, barren piece of soil. They get so excited when they see what's possible, when they see the life brought back to it. The insects, the birds, the rabbits, they want to know how we do it, and they want to become a part of it. And that, in my mind, is the real harvest. So when you get a tour of the birdhouse, you're actually getting a constellation of little projects here and there. Each one enrolling the neighbors in this notion of possibility, understanding ecosystem restoration and why and how. And we have fun doing it. <laughs> okay, well, I feel like I should probably uh, cut it off here. I don't know what the time is like, but um, we're getting late. So I, um, I just want to leave it with this, this piece, which is um, really we're operating from the sort of fundamental idea that we have a hard time imagining a more beautiful future a more engaging, um, fulfilling, because we've been so inundated with the opposite through media. And so a big piece of what we're doing is uh, um, trying to exercise the imagination. And we call uh, this radical possibilities course that we offer um, an opportunity to imagine the ecological renaissance of our wildest dreams. And uh, we do that from this standpoint of features of, the, of, of what it means socially and economically and technologically and, and like that. But um, yeah, we, I don't, I, I don't think I need to do any more of this. There's some before and afters of the sites and um, it's just really a pleasure and an honor to be recognized by the city and to be offered um, plots of land and um, a seat at the table on the fire panel um, that will help shape policy and activities here. And uh, Cameron and Jessica, this is a uh, constructed wetland for biomediation of our gray water. Um, this is a compost system that we've been using, and we have a number of these kind of around various sites. And uh, but what I was going to say is that we are we are working with indigenous uh, for locally as well as throughout California, including Ali Metters Knights, who I'm honored to. Uh, Cameron and Jessica have been heading that up. Um, it's a culturally cultural advocacy uh, training really, and um, to bring these traditional educational uh, ec ecological knowledge to the, to the table with the city of LA fire department is, is an honor. Here we see um, the soil food web biocomplete windrow that we are uh, beginning teach the neighbors. And uh, because we got a grant as part of the, um, what is it, SB 1383 that Janelle was speaking about, that's, um, we got a compost grant. So neighbors are bringing their food wastes here, but also we are using um, waste streams of the neighborhood to create this biocomplete compost that we inoculate our, our, our sites with teas and extracts. <coughs> And uh, I can't go without saying something about the Soil Sponge Collective, which is really just a group of volunteers led by Linda Gibbs, who is a soil food web uh, student. And uh, she's just a great leader in uh, teaching us these systems. And uh, we go around in all, of, all parts of Los Angeles uh, healing the land. And as volunteers, it just feels good to do it together. Jin is the uh, real energetic force behind it. She's there with her plants. 
Um, oh yeah, and the program uh, monitoring and evaluation is um, something I think that uh, we're helping um, with. This is Cameron who made the uh, poster boy of the soil framework of the ecosystem restoration. And uh, we were pleased to, to know that uh, the architect of the system for the ERC is um, using the data that we're uh, giving them to um, as the baseline evaluation for his graduate thesis. And here is Frank and Nancy, uh, soil scientists who are volunteering to perform and teach these methods of monitoring. Uh, all right, and last but not least is uh, this rake exchange uh, program to end leaf blowing in our canyon. And um, we make, we grow the bamboo and we make these rakes and we uh, make these brooms from date palm berry sprigs that are found everywhere in this area because they fall from the trees. Um, so there you have it. Um, we have an amazing body of advisors and um, I'd say um, that really we're interested in how we can ensure the longevity of the things that we're planting. And I'd say also that one of the things that we're doing is training folks so that they can be deployed in a way to be effective on other ecosystem restoration camps in California and around the world. We feel like this is a, our um, resource is really people and um, inspiring them to and educating them with skills that can be effective when they go out to uh, help out locations like the ones we've seen today. So thank you all and I'll put some uh, links in the chat while we're carrying on here. Any questions and whatnot. Thank you so much. Thank you, Johnny. That was very inspiring and I'm not soon going to forget the term you used, which was ecological renaissance because something that strikes me as I've been listening to your different projects and it, they all have unique expressions of something, right? And I just love that, the way that it's manifesting in these different ways through, but through a connection, you know? So um, Sammy's gonna share out some slides where we've collected a few of the questions that have come up um, today. And uh, I, I already shared the first one with you, which I, I think that John and Johnny have both um, spoken to, but I, I wanted to give Bob and Janelle a chance to, to share a little bit of their perspectives on this question about um, indigenous ecological knowledge and the incorporation of that into your projects, if you want to. Sure, um, I, can, I can start. Mine um, will likely be a little bit briefer than, than Janelle's. Um, we're, we're pretty new to, um, to working with, you know, with the Native American population people. Um, and so I'd say that, you know, we've, we've drawn a lot of inspiration from the community and we've, we've reached out to um, a couple of different um, groups to, you know, to collaborate. Um, but the biggest, the biggest place that we're encountering the native population is at the Mendocino County Jail, where we're um, we're doing our um, botanical sanctuary and ecosystem restoration project for the unconditional freedom project. And um, there's a disproportionate amount of the inmates that come through the jail. Um, I'm not sure if it's 30 or 60 percent, but it's um, it's it's pretty staggering. Um, and so we're, we're just starting to, you know, to build those relationships since we've been working at the jail, I think for about two years now. And, um, and it's, you know, and, and the next stage of that relationship is, is going to be starting to, um, learn more about their, the communities that they come from. And, you know, unfortunately, Sheriff Kendall, the Mendocino County Sheriff um, was raised in Covalo on a Native American reservation. And so um, that's, 
that's a, a big part of our future is, you know, is developing that relationship further. And, you know, and as we work with the students at the jail as part of the botanical sanctuary. Over to you, Janelle. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, I know I, I probably covered it pretty heavily in our presentation already because this has definitely been uh, almost foundational in the work that we've been doing as far as long-term restoration is concerned in our area. Um, while the Maidu tribe is federally recognized in our area, um, we also have the Concow tribes who are not federally recognized. So we've, you know, there's been a, a big movement in this area to get them back into uh, being recognized and getting the um, respect that they, they deserve in this area for their stewardship over the last couple thousand years. Um, and also just making people aware that they are still here. <laughs> um, you know, having or you know, hosting an eco camp in California, we decided that it was uh, extremely important to in include indigenous and you know TEK knowledge into all of our practices and restoration work. Um, anyone who's familiar with California's history know that we have a very brutal uh, and unwelcoming relationship with indigenous populations in this area. And we thought it was very important to recognize that and make people aware of it on the chance that they weren't. And also, you know, bring California back to what it was, you know, our relationships with fire uh, since the colonial area out here has been a phenomenal failure. <laughs> uh, fire suppression efforts uh, have been unsuccessful, which is becoming abundantly clear. I think. Uh, all of the presenters here can, can speak to that from personal experience at this point to some degree. Uh, and, and, you know, I think TEK is really putting us back into this relationship that's not only appropriate, but it's getting people to recognize that the land is where we derive everything we need to live. Um, it's, it's not about what you put on the land and how you own it. It's about how you have relationship with it and how you treat it. Uh, you know, it reflects in our own health, both physical and mental. And, and yeah, and how we experience these natural processes. We call wildfire a disaster, but it's natural. It happens. This ecosystem has been experiencing and thriving in those conditions for, you know, millions of years at this point. And it's just since we've come here that we start viewing this as a catastrophe and it's because of how we live. So it's, yeah, been a really underlying theme in a lot of the work that we've done. And we, you know, work very closely with local indigenous folks in making decisions about how to go about restoration. And I think kind of a side note to all of that too, is that a lot of traditional land stewardship practices are very low tech, which also makes them very much accessible to folks. Uh, and it turns land restoration into this slow incremental process that's achievable for people, uh, which is important after we've gone through these disasters and people just don't know where to start afterwards. So I hope that answers the question a little bit better. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for for all that you're sharing and and doing with these projects to bring in that indigenous wisdom that's right there as a as an opportunity is, is wonderful. So um, we're going to bring up our next question. I think we could probably get through one or two if we are all, you know, judicious with our answers, which I know that can be a trouble for me as well. But Sammy, do you have the next slide for us? Excellent. Um, we had Joseph ask if there, if you know of any state or federal programs to help create things like the local kitchens that were mentioned. I, I think Bob, you, you've had some success at um, fundraising um, in the last few weeks and months. 
Is there mm -hmm. anything like that? Yeah, I, I don't know any. Um, most of our most of free foods funding comes from private donations, um, and so we we haven't really gotten into exploring the federal or state funding for those programs. Although I'm sure that they exist, um, most of our most of our funding for the Earth Program and um, and other you know and, and projects on the land has come from state and federal grants um so whether it's drought related grants or agricultural grants or forestry grants that approach fire i know there's a ton of stuff around that um but yeah unfortunately i'm not very well versed in um, local kitchen programs um, for feeding people I, I think one of the things that we're discussing too is that here at the land which is 160 acres and then there's many other places, but this this place could be a training center that creates kind of cores of, of people. And those cores then go out and go to the worst places and go to go to places which can be restored. And that can be in connection with federal and state programs to do what needs to be done. So right. that, that could be uh, set up in that sort of way, but I don't know of any directly right now. It seems like a great opportunity as you are finding the linkages between these communities that a movement can arise for some more um, advocacy of such things as well. And that's an exciting uh, perspective um, that you're bringing to the table but by having these groups self-organize and have them autonomous but connected, there's the chance that some groups are really going to find these recipes to success. So, okay, uh, we have another question on the next slide here from Hayes. And I guess maybe I <laughs> seeded the idea a little bit with the political advocacy, but what are some of your expansionary visions moving forward for your projects and, and for the movement? Um, to you know, connect and structure. I bet that there's a tension that you feel between having it too formalized versus not formalized enough, right, across the world. So I'd love to know the answer um, to this too, in terms of your strategy and vision. Well, uh, I guess I'll speak to that. Um, we ha have been creating some regional conversations. So Mediterranean. Middle East and North Africa is a good example. There's some movement in Amazonia and there's some some things that started actually here in California to create a, a, a council. Uh, that's kind of, it, it, it depends on how much people get uh, connected to um, institution building and how much they get connected to restoration. And I think restoration is the real thing and institution building is something that should just be serving. So we don't wanna to be too, too institutional. We, we wanna empower the maximum number of people to be able to act and have agency and sovereignty over their own behavior and their own actions. And I think that's the way to get the most people around the world engaged in this. And if we if we act as a species on a planetary scale, to me, that's the expansion that we need. We don't need new institutions or more institutions. We need to empower everybody to make the central intention of human civilization to restore Earth systems. If that happens, then the economy will be healed. There'll be full full employment. There'll be food security. There'll be peace. So that's kind of what we need, I think. I see a lot of heads nodding and thumbs up from the panel. So <laughs> I, I love to see that, that you're of one mind in the philosophical approach there, which sounds much more like trust in the abundance and potential. And that's wonderful. That's a huge part of, of the whole mindset shift that we need as a species, right? <laughs> so I think we could maybe get to one more question here. 
we, we started a little late due to some technical difficulties. So I think we may just go past the hour just, just a little bit, but I, I recognize that everybody may have other meetings to get to. Would it be possible for me to add something that I've been kind of sitting here going, I want to put th this piece of information into this, into this meeting. Please, um, your name is on the masthead. Yeah, I've been <laughs> panelist here and I'm not paneling anything. So it, here's my chance. Um, when we've been working with people, especially in the western part of the United States, uh, with uh, large wildfires, what we've noticed is that people who have started to use the proper sets of microorganisms to build soil structure, to hold water in the soil, to maintain the health of the plant, to make that plant resistant to diseases and pests, that as we get that process going, and the first example that really struck me was uh, pa uh, Paradise in California, when we had several employees who lived in Paradise and um, had started to put the biology onto the plants on their property. And the fire burned all of the houses around them. And, um, their house, their property was not harmed. So we, we another way to get that, mm, you know, some emphasis to, to people that even though a fire might happen, when all of your plants have the moisture in them, when your root systems are down there in the water that's been stored by rebuilding soil structure, um, there has to be somebody in the um, in the governmental um, halls that would want to do some proper work on that. We um, need to very much copy the um, work. We need to mimic what nature does and move away from destruction of the natural system. And with microbes, we will do it. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I'm, that's the first time I'm hearing that story, but we need to write a communication about that, Elaine. <laughs> get some pictures. Yep, get some pictures. Well, and it's like, we didn't realize at first that, well, we didn't realize that paradise was going to burn and that we would have replicate um, uh, things, um, properties that we could compare. Um, so, it's, uh, you know, can people who are improved in the biology and the soil that are um, doing the work that you're talking about here, when a fire comes through, we, you know, can we uh, uh, keep track of um, those areas, those properties that didn't burn while all of their neighbors did? Amazing. You know, it's we can either look at the future as it's going to be on fire, or we can look at today the things that we can do as a community to move towards this ecological renaissance. Yeah. The Absolutely. other fun thing in California that has to happen is all of those waterways that they basically put into cement bunkers. And then they wonder why their groundwater has dropped 30 feet. Uh, duh. Um, come on, we've got to point out these really important things and maybe make people rethink the fact that, okay, they're going to have a flood every once in a while, but on the other hand, they will possibly be able to um, not have the wildfires that they're having. Yeah. I, well, I think I, oh, I, I, I'd like to just add one thing. I think there we're the ecosystem restoration camps movement and the soil food web school are getting much closer together in terms of training around the world. So the uh, experience that the soil food web school has can now be uh, helped to drive the training in the ecosystem restoration camps. So we think that's exciting. And I think if we also get this concept of the cores creating uh, conservation cores and and realizing that this is 
not an individual activity. This is not a single organization. This is a, a this is a collaborative sport. So we need to uh, work together to make it happen. And I think the the situation is is now. Uh, you know, very, very positive in this regard. I mean, I, I, I have been doing this for th three decades and in the past, it was not a thing, you know, like people would like, sort of like, what are you talking about, John, shut up, you know, but gradually, uh, it sort of raised uh, up into um, like cream rising to the top. The idea that we could restore degraded lands just makes so much sense. And it, it is, in terms of real act, actions, rather than uh, just some kind of theoretical thing. So, so getting it into reality and then looking like, can we come up with 50 Spartans? who are strong and who are ready to take on the worst cases. And can we learn how to train them in the basics in say three months? And then could we have a three month training course for people and, and then we are doing restoration. And at the same time, we teach uh, fire, fire uh, prevention and fire, uh, response. So we have a core that is ecologically trained and ready to, to work all the time. And then when the crisis does come, they're also prepared to react and they know how to, to feed themselves, camp out. And if we can set this up, then we can just move the cores from the training directly into into spaces which need to be done we we already know now that certainly in this part of the country and all over the west and southwest and northwest and the prairie states the desert states all of them need this action so you know it's it, instead of having the government just continuously talking about the need for it why don't we just like prepare the cores and see that we get one core done in three months and we get a second we get a second core done and then we get four cores done and eight cores and sixteen cores and so on. And so the, these teams are well suited and and ready to teach others. So that's that's my contribution to that. And thank you. Elaine and the Soil Food Web School, we're excited to work together. Thank you so much for, to all of our panelists. And um, as Sammy has posted in the chat, you know, be looking for some um, some future collaborative uh, energy around these groups and the Soil Food Web School. I'm so excited to be that this is just the beginning of the conversation. And I know we didn't get to a lot of questions today, but I'm going to try to facilitate something where we share those among the panelists and get some responses and find a way to get those out to our community because there were some great, great questions coming through. So, but thank you all for your time and for dealing with the tech issues today. We appreciate it. And Thanks thank everybody. This that. was amazing. Looking forward to get all those questions, Adam, and we can do it by in writing and send it back to Sammy and get it back up. Excellent. I want to acknowledge Sammy and Heather and David and other members of our tech team, um, Alex, who have who have been helping today while we're putting out some fires that I think are actually probably global issues with something in the technology today. <laughs> Something's in the air. Well, we have a, a, a part of our website that will um put all the answers to people's various questions so people could review through that or are we sending those all out to, to people by email or how how do how does the um, whole community get to get to find out about the answers for to their questions well let's come up with a strategy for that 
I know, and I, here I, I am, I, the uh, I'm president, asking that question of. <laughs> but I it's, think I think the answers could be connected to the replaying of the of of the thing. So it's just in writing there, it's available to to have all the questions and all the answers in one place that's yeah. downloadable. That's a great Concrete. idea, Elaine and John. We can definitely facilitate that happening. Maybe so. Awesome. Well, thanks again. We'll see you all next time. Oh, we can go to the new camp that somebody wants to start in Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That, 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 that Bye, sound, everybody. That sounds good. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Ciao. Thank you much. Thank you. Uh, Don't forget to ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos. videos.